Okay, so if you could go to the Why Do We Care slide, um, there's this kind of fun example that almost all of you can relate to, which is you're at the doctor's office and you're about to have your blood pressure taken and maybe your legs are crossed or you're lifting your arm a little bit or you're a little bit slumped and the nurse is like, oh no, that won't do. You need to be perfectly si sitting here aligned with your arm aligned with your heart and all they make it sound like it's this huge deal, right? The question is, why is that? In this chapter, we're going to find out why it is absolutely essential that if you take your blood pressure, you need to actually be perfectly aligned with your heart. Otherwise, you're going to get um, an off result. And in fact, if we were taking this course face to face, um, I would prove it to you. There's a lab that, we, that I often do where we prove that taking the blood pressure above your head or below your head or at your ankle, let's say, is... A recipe for totally destroying your blood pressure and making you think that either you're dead or that you have the most stressed out high blood pressure possible for a human being. So um, by the end of this chapter, we will in fact have a solution or at least an understanding of why that is the case. Okay. Um, so the next slide says the three hold water experiment. This is a demo that I would normally do in front of a live class. I will do it in this learning glass format. Um, stay tuned for that in a, another link in the module, okay? Um, but first, I would like to explore the question of what is a fluid? So if you go to that slide, what is a fluid? Well, gases are fluids. We usually don't think of gases as fluids. Traditionally, in our minds, we think of liquids as fluids. Um, but in the scientific context, a gas is a fluid. And what is a gas? Well, a gas is a state of matter in which molecules are free to move throughout space, right? They're not bound to each other. In other words, they're at a temperature such that the average kinetic energy of each molecule is greater than the binding energy that holds molecules together when they're in a liquid form, okay? So there's these small electrostatic attractions that happen between molecules, okay? And when they're in a liquid state, that electrostatic attraction is a certain amount of potential energy, right? Almost like a spring potential energy, like you have to like work to pull it apart. Now, when the molecules have enough energy in the form of their temperature, they are actually able to break away, right? Leave, leave those little bonds and they become a gas and they're freely moving around some space, right? Molecules do not interact except for occasional collisions with each other and the walls. So in a gas, there's very, very little interaction between those molecules or elements. Um, and lastly, the molecules are very far apart, which means that a gas is compressible. If you, know, you have molecules that are far apart, there's room for them to either expand or to contract, and that's the concept of compressibility. So another form of a fluid is a liquid, okay? Liquids are weakly bound. Their temperature is not such that they have enough energy to break those small electrostatic attractions that hold stuff together um, when it's a liquid. This is something that very few people know and understand, um, that the reason why solids are solids and the reason why liquids are liquids are actually because there are these very small electrostatic interactions that happen between all elements and molecules, and that to go from one state to another, you need to have enough energy to break those bonds, okay? Um, those attractions. So a liquid is incompressible because the molecules can't get any closer, even though they are able to kind of like freely move, right, about each other and around each other. Um, there's really not a heck of a lot of space between them, so you can't squeeze them and you can't pull them apart, okay? Um, next, weak bonds allow the molecules to move around. That's pretty much what we know of as a liquid, right? I mean, the, the molecules are able to kind of like slide and move around each other. Um, sorry for all the rave movements. Okay, um, what do all fluids have in common, both liquids and gases? Well, they both exert a pressure, okay? And I have a video here in this next slide, which I will also share in the module, um, that reminds you that even though we don't think we are, we are actually under a tremendous amount of pressure, okay? Our bodies, glorious as they are, were designed to withstand that degree of pressure. Um, and, you know, so we don't 
acknowledge it and feel it all of our lives, otherwise it would be very distracting. But if suddenly whatever was creating the pressure inside my body that resists the pressure of the atmosphere outside my body, okay, if that were to go away, I would simply crumple in on myself. And this is actually um, showing and demonstrating that principle by pulling the air, pulling the atmosphere out of a tanker, an oil tanker, and showing that the, the actual pressure of the atmosphere is such that it would crumple and crush something made of metal that looks incredibly sturdy. So take a look at that. That's pretty cool. Um, what is pressure, though? How do we actually define it in a physical sense? Okay. So though you might think of pressure as a force, it is really about how much force you have applied per unit area of a surface, right? So the definition of pressure is that actually pressure is the force exerted per unit area for some on some object or on some surface, okay? And so this could be the pressure that's felt, like the force that's felt in a balloon, for example, that's inflated, right? What is the force per unit surface area of that entire balloon? And it could even be, you know, if you have like a high heel, right? Um, it could be what is the force per unit area exerted by that little, that little heel of the high heel, okay? Um, and so this kind of explains, for example, in the case of shoes, right, why it hurts so much if you are stepped on by a high heel versus like a tennis shoe, right? A tennis shoe, the A, the, you know, the person's force stays the same, the force is the weight, right? But the A of a tennis shoe increases, so the overall pressure would decrease, right? But in the case of a high heel, a decreases, so the pressure should increase pretty dramatically, right? Which explains why, you know, if you're at a ball and you're stepped on by a high heel, it's incredibly painful, possibly could break your foot, whereas getting stepped on by a tennis shoe is like, oh, it's no big deal, okay? All right, um, pressure is a scalar, okay? It's not a vector. The unit for pressure, the SI unit, is one pascal, um, and a pascal is one newton per meter squared. So I'll just write that there. One pascal is the SI unit, but that is one newton per meter squared. Funny thing about pressure, though, is that even though this is the SI unit, it's often given in many other units that are commonly used. So expect a lot of conversions. Um, one of the biggest units that you see in chemistry is the atmosphere, right, which is the amount of pressure that we our atmosphere automatically exerts on us, and that is 10 to the 5 Pascal, right? Just goes to show you how much pressure just the atmosphere is applying on us uh, at any given time, okay? Um, and um, milligra uh, millimeters of mercury is another common unit for pressure, and um, tors is another unit for pressure, and Primarily, we will be using these two, um, but just know that you're going to see different units of pressure come up uh, as the course goes on and you, as your scientific career goes on, okay? Um, one fun little example, if you guys could go to the next slide that says the physics of pause. One kind of fun example of how this relates to uh, the world of, of animals um, is the physics of pause, right? So, for example, Animals that have to walk in the snow, um, like this lynx, for example, tend to have very, very large paws. And that large surface area, remember pressure is equal to force per area, right? So that large surface area reduces the pressure that those paws are actually putting on the ground, on the snow, and it makes it less likely that the lynx or any snow type animal will um, actually fall through the snow and penetrate the surface. Right? You don't want to be sinking into the snow if you have to go hunting or run away from predators, right? So those large paws decrease the pressure and makes it less likely that you will fall into the snow, which is kind of cool and kind of cute. Um, there's another type of pressure, um, which is hydrostatic pressure. And um, I will like to go over that in the next video. 
And it explains why it is that you, when you're swimming in the water, start to feel that like intense pressure in your ears. Um, so we'll talk about that in the next video. See you there.